Welcome, Professor Martin Hellman, who will talk to us about cybersecurity, nuclear security, Alan Turing, and illogical logic. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the organizing committee for doing such a wonderful job of uh, arranging this and uh, making it so easy for me to get here and making me feel so welcome. And uh, also, of course, thank you to the ACM Turing Award Selection Committee, because without them, I wouldn't be here giving this talk. This award recognizes work that I did 40 years ago, uh, as was just pointed out. And it's understandable that since then, my work has taken turns. My focus is considerably different. In fact, my most recent project, the thing I'm focused on now, is a book my wife and I just finished with the improbable subtitle, for, at least for a conference like this, Creating True Love at Home and Peace on the Planet. So this talk will draw connections between those two seemingly unrelated areas. But the first connection is easy. There's a million dollars that comes with the Turing Award, thanks to Google. And uh, of course, Wit gets half and I get half. And my wife and I quickly agreed to use our half to um, further our work on building a more peaceful, sustainable world. And with the initial focus, maybe the only focus being this book we've just written. Uh, so a little bit of a book. Oh, got to watch the glasses down there. A little bit of a book plug if you want to get it. And by the end of this talk, I hope you will, even though the talk's primarily about cryptography. Uh, the website is three words run together, a new map, a new map .com. And you can also get to it from my Stanford uh, homepage. It's got links, particularly the very last link will take you there. But this is the ACM Conference on Computer, Computer and Communication Security. It's not the ACM Conference on Marriage Counseling. It's not the ACM Conference on Peace. So I will start with cybersecurity and only connect it to the book uh, toward the end and then briefly. So let's go back to March 1975, uh, a year and a half before the New Directions uh, appeared. That was when the um, National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, this is the American uh, National Bureau of Standards, uh, promulgated or published in the Federal Register a proposed data encryption standard, which today we know as DES or DES. And Witt and I looked at this and quickly concluded that its key size was, a, was, was questionable. It had a 56-bit key size, which of course is a very strange key size. And that was kind of masked by the fact that the key was specified to be 64 bits. But one of the first things the algorithm did was to throw away eight of the bits. So even if you tried using all 64, you couldn't. The excuse was they were parity bits, but that was a very bad excuse. They really wanted a 56-bit key size. And that's because a 56-bit key size, we concluded, was searchable exhaustively even in 1975, or certainly within a few years when the standard would be in widespread use. Now, 2 to the 56, the number of keys that you'd have to search, is um, roughly 10 to the 17th. That's 100,000 million million keys, which sounded, especially in 1975, like an, an impossible number to search. But Witt and I uh, estimated you could build a single chip that would do a, a million key searches per second. And if you're designing a custom chip, you build a million of them. And how many keys are you searching per second? A million million, right? 10 to the 12th. So how long does it take to search all 100,000 million million keys? Only 100,000 seconds, which is a little more than a day. So order of magnitude, it took about a day to search these keys, uh, the key space. And we estimated that the cost would be about $10,000 per solution. And we noted that it didn't really matter if we were off even by an order of magnitude. That is, even if it cost $100,000 per solution, that would be erased by five years because of the march of Moore's law and uh, the decreasing cost of computation. Um, a major battle ensued because initially we just thought this was a mistake and we tried to get the key size increased. But over time, it became clear that this was not a mistake. It was a design feature. And, uh, unpublished, and that was because NSA, the American National Security Agency, wanted to make sure that it could 
break the cipher if it was used by adversaries, which of course makes sense if the American government's putting this forth. But that created problems, as you can imagine, between, it's very similar to the um, argument today between the FBI and, and, and Apple, which I'll return to later. Soon after DES was announced, uh, Witt and I came up with the concept of public key cryptography, which made the problem even worse for NSA. Because it turns out 56 bits is actually a large key size compared to what they were used to. In fact, they were used to no encryption at all. They were just able to suck up unencrypted data and search it for, at, at, at very low cost. And so even $10,000 per key was a horrendous expense for them. But I think they reasoned, and there's evidence that they did, that um, people wouldn't change keys too frequently because it was so expensive to change keys. You had to send a courier or a registered letter. But public key cryptography allowed people to change keys uh, once a day, once a minute, if they wanted to. So it made the battle even more intense. Now, public key cryptography has been called revolutionary, and I don't want to stop people from doing that. Uh, please continue doing that. <laughs> but I don't have time. There's a whole talk I have on the evolution of public key cryptography, which by the end of it, I, I, I say, you'll wonder why it took us so long. And here, I'll just mention one example, and that was a trapdoor crypto system. This concept had occurred to us uh, somewhat before public key cryptography, and we saw it initially in the military context. If you're a general, you want your troops to have secure encryption. But if that device is captured by the enemy, you don't want them to be able to use it and keep you in the dark. So the ideal military cryptographic system is a trapdoor cryptographic system, one where you know trapdoor information that your opponent doesn't, so it appears secure to him. But if it's ever used by your opponent, you can break it. From there to public key cryptography is a relatively small step, and I'm pretty sure that's in new directions in cryptography. So that's one of the things where I say there are almost these signs pointing us toward public key cryptography. Now, Ralph Merkel is a name that few of, not all of you may know, and I want to make sure you do. Uh, Ralph Merkel was an undergraduate working at Berkeley independently of Witt and myself, and then he was a master's student there. And he independently came up with the concept of public key distribution. He didn't have digital signatures, but he had public key distribution. And um, as a result of that, we published separately because he was working independently of us. And that's really unfortunate because now he's one of the great unsung heroes of public key cryptography. In fact, the algorithm that I came up with at my desk probably 1 a.m. in the morning, it was late at night in May of 1976, which is now called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange, I've argued should be called Diffie-Hellman Merkel Key Exchange, if names are assigned to it, because it is a Merkel system based on his public key distribution method, not a public key crypto system that Witt and I had proposed. Now, the DES key size fight uh, heated up, and two high-level NSA employees flew out to California in January 1976 because it had become clear to us by that point that we were not going to solve this problem by technical arguments. We had a political fight, and we had to go to Congress and get hearings. We had to go to the press and get press coverage. And as NSA got wind of this, these two high-level uh, people came out, and I remember their, almost their exact words, please be quiet. You're wrong, but please shut up. If you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to cause grave harm to national security. Now, of course, that doesn't make sense. What they really meant is you're right, but please be quiet. If you keep saying what you're saying, you're going to cause grave harm to national security. Now, this was just a few years after the Watergate revelations, and so statements like that were questionable in any event, but especially at that point in time. Uh, I did go home that night and tried to figure out the right thing to do, because on the one hand, I had my intellect telling me that NSA should not set the security level that the whole country, really the whole world, will be using based on its interests and do it in secret without telling anyone, and in fact, hiding the fact. On the other hand, I had these two NSA employees telling me that continuing on that path was going to cause grave harm to my country. And I don't have time to go into the details, but there is a uh, section in the book about this, uh, the book my wife and I wrote, where I describe as I sat down to try to figure out the right thing to do, an idea pops into my head. Forget about what's right and wrong. You'll never have more chance to influence the world. Run with it. And this is what I call a shadow motivation. 
it, it comes from psychology, the idea of shadow side. It's the sides of ourselves, individually and nationally, that are so socially unacceptable that we can't admit they exist even at our own conscious, in our own conscious minds. But at an unconscious level, they run us around. So it's actually surprising that this shadow motivation had popped up at a conscious level. And so I liken it in the movies. You know how the devil appears on the actor's shoulder and whispers in his ear? Well, it was like that. And I thought that I brushed the devil off my shoulder and made the right decision. But again, there's no time for it, but there's a story in this book uh, that we wrote where I described five years later watching a documentary about the making of the first atom bomb, the Manhattan Project, and uh, how I believe the Manhattan Project scientists fooled themselves. They all said their motivation for working on this horrible weapon was Nazi Germany, Hitler. And yet, when Hitler was defeated, they kept working. Why? Well, I went back, this was 1981, five years after uh, my devil on the shoulder experience. I realized that they had probably done what I knew I had done in 1976. I hadn't figured out the right thing to do and then done it. I'd figured out what I wanted to do and then done it, uh, and then come up with the rationalizations for why it was the right thing to do. And I, fortunately, uh, the decision I made was the right one, and we'll see that later as the talk goes on. Even the director of NSA at the time has admitted it was the right decision. Uh, well, in fact, I'll mention that now. In an interview two years ago, Admiral Bobby Inman, who was director of NSA uh, in, 1970, in the late 1970s, um, was asked, so with what you now know, would you still try to suppress Hellman's work? And he says, quite the opposite. I would try to get it out as quickly as possible. And he cites the theft of uh, um, uh, jet fighter plans by the Chinese as proof that we need strong encryption at a commercial level to protect even America's national security. But that was sheer luck that I made the right decision. If I'd been working on the Manhattan Project, I think I, I'm sure I would have fooled myself the way I think the, the scientists did. I vowed never to make that mistake again, but that's not as easy as it is as it might sound, and there's another story in the book, which again I don't have time for, uh, that involves my patent fight, Stanford's patent fight with MIT and RSA data security, where um, I had, I was so angry at them at the time. We're good friends now, by the way, uh, but at the time I was so angry at them uh, for not paying royalties on our uh, invention that uh, um, I couldn't be sure I wasn't fooling myself when someone came to me with a proposition that could have hurt them. Uh, and so how I made that decision, how I made sure I wasn't fooling myself, I'll leave to the book. All of this is what I call the first, in fact, most of us call the first crypto war. And this was in the mid to late 70s, early 80s, about the freedom to publish. And fortunately, that war has been won. But I'll tell you one other story um, about that. And this is in July 1977. A man named Joseph Meyer, who belong, is a, a member of the IEEE, writes a letter to the IEEE, where I was publishing most of my papers, in fact, all my papers at that time. And he says he's concerned as an IEEE member that the organization is violating the law by publishing certain papers. Now, it's really interesting. When people talk about cryptography, at least in those days, I don't know if it's still true, they talk in code. They don't say exactly what they mean. So he didn't say, you're publishing Hellman's papers, he, but he listed like five or six journal issues, and I had a paper in every single one except for one of them. The IEEE in responding also talked in code. Um, they sent a copy of the response to me as a member of the Board of Governors of one of the IEEE groups publishing most of these papers, but they didn't send it to everyone else on the Board of Governors. So they were sending it to me because they knew I was the uh, target of all this. Um, I had a meeting with John Schwartz, the, um, oh, the, the letter that the IEEE wrote back to Meyer said, we're well aware of the, this law, but it's always been our position that we cannot enforce it. It's up to the authors and their institutions to make sure they're not violating the law by publishing their papers. So I went to Stanford's general counsel, who at that time was named John Schwartz, for two reasons. One, Stanford might be liable, and the other reason being that if I was prosecuted, which was a real threat at that point in time, I wanted to make sure that Stanford would defend me. Because just hiring an attorney for a multi-year court case uh, can bankrupt you. 
So I'll never forget the meeting a few days after I gave the letters to uh, John Schwartz. We met again, and he told me that it was his legal opinion that if the law was construed broadly enough to cover my work, my publishing papers, then it was unconstitutional. It would violate freedom of speech, freedom of uh, publication. But he also warned me that that was just his legal opinion, and the only way to really determine this would be in a court. And he told me if I was prosecuted, Stanford would defend me. If I was convicted, they would appeal. But then, words I'll never forget, if you're, all appeals are exhausted, we can't go to jail for you. So, but I felt comfortable, and he also said something else. Um, we had, um, I had two papers coming up in October at a conference at Cornell University, an international symposium on information theory, with two students, Ralph Merkel and Steve Polig. And um, John Schwartz, Stanford's general counsel, strongly recommended that I deliver the papers rather than the students as originally planned. And he pointed out a number of reasons, but perhaps the most practical was if there was a multi-year court case, I was a tenured professor, my career could withstand that kind of case, but uh, a newly minted PhD, um, uh, as bright as he may, his, his smile may be, uh, his, his career would have trouble withstanding that. So I went to the students and I told them the situation. I said, I'm happy to deliver the papers. Uh, I'm not worried with Stanford's financial backing. The students initially both said, no, we'll give the papers. We're not worried either. But about a week later, they both came back to me and said, our parents have been beating on us like crazy over the phone, and they're really worried, so yes, would you please give the paper? So when the time came at the symposium for the first and then the second paper, uh, and everyone knew what was going on, I went up with uh, Ralph and Steve, and I told the audience, I said, uh, normally uh, Steve or Ralph would be giving this paper, but uh, on the advice of Stanford's counsel, I'll be giving it instead. However, I want him to get the credit he deserves. So while he will stand up here mute, not saying a single word, I want you to consider the words coming from my mouth as if they're coming from his, except legally. <laughs> and as you can imagine, the students got more credit and more attention that way than they ever would have gotten otherwise. That's the lawyer. So, NSA and I were fighting this battle in the press, and in fact, NSA was never talking directly. There's always things like uh, Joseph Meyer writing a letter from his home address, even though he worked at NSA, although we later came to believe that he did that on his own. But there were certainly people in the agency who felt that way. But then something happened. In uh, 1978, I get a call from the director's office at NSA. Uh, Admiral Inman, the uh, director of NSA, is, would like to visit me when he's in California. Would I be open? to the possibility. Well, I jumped at the opportunity, and uh, it was, I felt it was much better to talk than to fight it out in the press and have no idea what they were actually saying. And when Inman came to my office, he said, he, the, he told me that he was there against the advice of all the senior, the other senior people at the agency. But he said, I don't see the harm in talking. And that is really out of the box approach to things that we need more of today. Our initial conversation was cautious. In fact, his first words to me were, it's nice to see that you don't have horns. Because that's the way I was being portrayed at NSA. I was the devil incarnate. And I looked at him and I said, same here, because I had seen NSA as more like Darth Vader. And I thought of myself as Luke Skywalker. I was in my early 30s, I'm now 71. And so the young hero was a more appropriate uh, model. Now, while that was a, initially a cautious relationship, it, uh, later we became friends, and in fact, uh, Admiral Inman signed a statement of support about eight years ago when I first started applying risk analysis to a potential failure of nuclear deterrence. In the mid-1990s, uh, so about 15 years later, Congress, the American Congress, asked the National Academies, through its research arm, the National Research Council, to do a study of national cryptographic policy. The internet was beginning to bloom, and they could see other places where maybe the severe limitations on cryptographic equipment, which were in place because of export restrictions, were hurting the country rather than helping it. And that committee, 
uh, put out a report that many of you may be familiar with. It's called the Crisis Report, which stands for Cryptography's Role in Securing the Information Society. And the committee was very broad in its representation. It had people like me who were privacy advocates. It had a former attorney general, Benjamin Civiletti, representing the FBI and law enforcement's interests. It had a former deputy director of NSA, Ann Cara Christie, representing their interests. And because we came in and put aside our initial prejudices, we talked, and more importantly, we listened to one another, we ended up with unanimous conclusions which benefited the country and I believe the world in major ways. In particular, we recommended tremendous loosening of the export restrictions, uh, and not just for privacy, but to help national security in the way that Inman can see it today. So the point is, cybersecurity often depends more on government regulation than on technology. That was true back then, and it's somewhat true today. We can see the FBI Apple uh, legal case as an example. So one of the lessons in the book that my wife and I had to learn to stop fighting all the time was get curious, not furious. So when my wife used to do things that seemed crazy to me, I would treat her like she was crazy, driving her crazy, reinforcing my belief she was crazy. Now I go to her and I say, this feels crazy to me, but you're not crazy, what am I missing? And within seconds, usually, what seemed crazy is often brilliant and often makes my life better. And that same thing was true on this National Research Council Committee, and we need more of that today, I believe, in the work between not only the American government, but the uh, British Parliament has similar problems, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was true here in the European Union. Whoops, kicking glasses down there. So, in, in my marriage, getting curious, not furious, has reached a point where my wife and I are madly in love again, just like we were 50 years ago when we met. After, in the middle of that whole thing, we were probably headed for divorce. Now, I don't expect the FBI and the tech industry to be madly in love. I do, certainly don't expect the nations of the world to be madly in love with one another. But I do expect them to get rational enough so that we don't destroy ourselves. Which leads to another relationship between um, the book, what we say there, and what we need to learn to improve cybersecurity. Chapter 8 of the book is called, How Logical is Nuclear Deterrence? And as critical infrastructure becomes ever more dependent on connectivity, I think you could equally well title that chapter, How Logical is Cyber Deterrence? You hear people in the military particularly talking about the need for cyber deterrence. That's because they see nuclear deterrence as having been so successful that we should try to emulate it. But they never have really looked at how successful nuclear deterrence is. And so I, that's something I'm going to treat briefly right now. And it does relate to cybersecurity because of the calls for cyber deterrence. If nuclear deterrence isn't such a good strategy, maybe cyber deterrence is not such a good one either. Well, Proponents of nuclear deterrence point to the fact that we haven't had a world war in 71 years as proof that nuclear weapons and threatening to destroy the world if there is a war uh, works. But how much comfort should we derive from 71 years without World War III? Well, it turns out if you want 95% confidence, which is a typical statistical measure of confidence in your prediction, you can only predict you can only project one-third as far into the future as we can look back into the past. If you only want to be about 50% confident, then you can project roughly as far into the future as into the past. But if you want 95% confidence, we can only go about 20, 25 years into the future, which isn't so good. Well, I've spent a lot of time in the last eight, 10 years working on uh, risk analysis of nuclear deterrence. And here I'll just give you a very brief summary. Uh, in engineering, when we're trying to do rough estimates, we use what are called order of magnitude estimates. And so let's look at the order of magnitude estimate for how long you think nuclear deterrence can work before it fails and we destroy ourselves. One year seems too short to everyone I've talked to, and I've talked to about several hundred people about this over the last 10 years, maybe more. I mean, we've survived for 50 or 60 years of nuclear deterrence. We expect it to work for the next year, um, I mean, not with 100% probability, but it's more likely than not we'll survive another year. 
I then jumped to 10 years. Again, of course, people say, yes, it's more likely than not that we'll survive 10 years. But then I jump over 100 to the next power of 10, which is 1,000. And while there are rare exceptions, the vast majority of people, more than 95% of those I've interviewed, say 1,000 years sounds wildly optimistic. And I suspect that's true to most of you, too. So what's the only order of magnitude left? 100 years, right? Now, at first, that sounds OK, because none of us will be around in 100 years with high probability. But 100 years as a time horizon corresponds to 1% per year risk. Now, I'm not saying it's exactly 1%, because this is order of magnitude. It could be double that or half that, maybe even a factor of three off. But let's, for the moment, stick with 1%. That's 10% over the next decade. That's horrendous, given the consequences. A child born today has an expected lifetime of well over 80 years in the developed world. That child has worse than 50-50 odds if the risk is 1% per year. So why are we acting as if nuclear deterrence is a risk-free strategy? Well, now, how does this relate to cybersecurity? A similar risk framework can be applied to public key cryptography. Uh, what is the risk that a new factoring algorithm or a new algorithm for discrete logarithms will be found in the near future? Most of the concern for public key cryptography has been directed to quantum computing and finding quantum-resistant uh, algorithms for uh, public key cryptography. But very little has been oriented toward the question of another advance in factoring comparable to the number field SIV, which really increased the key sizes that were needed. So let's look at the history of advances in factoring, and discrete logarithms follows along the same way. In 1970, there was a major advance. This was Morrison and Brillhart's continued fraction factoring algorithm, which roughly doubled the size of the numbers we could factor. And so if public key cryptography had been around, we would have had to double key sizes. But of course, it wasn't around in 1970. In 1980, sieving, most people think in terms of the quadratic sieve of Pomerantz, but Pomerantz in his paper credits Richard Schropel, another of the unsung heroes of cryptography, with the, being the first one to really suggest using sieving in a slightly different way. And the quadratic sieve is a, uh, really a variant on uh, Schropel's approach. That doubled the key size needed yet again. Then 10 years later, in around 1990, the number field sieve was discovered, which again roughly doubled the size of numbers we could factor, and also was then applied to discrete logarithms. So we had advances every 10 years, 1970, 1980, 1990, but we haven't had one in 2000. We didn't have one in the next decade up through 2010. And so far in this decade, six years of which almost have passed, there has not been a major advance. So many people tend to say, it looks like factoring and discrete logarithms have hit a brick wall. But let's look at it through that same lens that I looked at nuclear deterrence, which seemed to be very so safe to society, and we saw that it was actually quite risky. In the same way, we'll see there's a significant risk uh, or there's a non-trivial risk that there will be an advance in factoring algorithms and we should be planning for it. Think of each decade as tossing a coin. If the coin shows heads, there was a major advance in factoring that decade. If the coin shows tails, there was not. Then what have we seen? 1970, heads. 1980, heads. 1990, heads. 2000, tails. 2010, tails. Now, even if this next decade shows tails and there's no further advance in the next four years, if you tossed a coin and saw, saw six, six times and saw heads, 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 tails, 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 would you predict tails into the indefinite future? No. So while it's only a model, I think that's an indication that there is a non-trivial chance, not necessarily a large chance, that we need to be concerned with advances in factoring and planning for it. Another relationship between the ACM Turing Award and this book that my wife and I wrote is in the first section of Chapter 8, and that was the one, How Logical is Nuclear Deterrence, which we've just seen is not as logical as we think it is. But I want to focus on another aspect directly related to the namesake of the ACM Turing Award, Alan Turing. The chapter's first section is called Illogical Logic. And it talks about how I felt when, as a second-year graduate student in 1968, I learned about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, another Austrian invention. Although I guess he may have done that in the United States. 
Um, I had, up to that point, and in fact, for, unfortunately, some years after, I based my whole life on logic. And here I had logic showing me that logic was literally incomplete. That's the name of the theorem, the incompleteness theorem. And I came home and told my wife, we'd been married about six or nine months at this point, I said, I felt like I was having a mental breakdown. And, but it turns out, well, the, it was too complex to put into the book. I put it all in terms of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. The earthquake, the logical earthquake that shook me the most was Alan Turing's proof that the computable real numbers were, while countable, were not effectively denumerable. And this gets a little tricky, and I'll put the full description in the uh, written version of this talk. And here I can only do a very quick hand-waving argument. So if you don't follow it, wait for the written version. In the late 19th century, the famous German mathematician George Cantor had proved that the real numbers were uncountably infinite, that there were different levels of infinity, all of naught, all of one, and so on. And the positive integers are clearly countable. That is, you can say there's a first one, like one, a second one, like two, a third one, like three, and so on. Um, even the rational numbers are countable. That's a little surprising, but uh, that can be shown fairly easily. But Cantor proved that the real numbers are uncountably infinite. They were bigger, in a very real sense, than the positive integers. He used a diagonalization argument. Uh, oh, he, he said, let's assume that they are countable, and then we will show a contradiction. If an assumption leads to an, a reductio ad absurdum, an ab a reduction to the absurd, then the assumption had to be wrong. And so he said, let's assume there's a first real number, R1. And let's, for sake of argument, say it's 0. So its binary expansion is 0 0.00000, right? Now, look at the first decimal place of that first assumed real number and complement it. So instead of a 0, we write, we write down a 1. Now, look at the second assumed real number. We don't, let's say it's 1. That's 1.000. You'd look at its second decimal, binary decimal place and complement that and write down a 1. After you've done all this, put a decimal point in front of the whole thing, you now have a real number that's not in the list, because it's not the first real number in the first decimal place, it's not the second real number in the second decimal place, and so on. Ergo, the real numbers are uncountably infinite. Now, Alan Turing defined computable real numbers. He also defined Turing machines, although he didn't call them that. We, just like we didn't, Witt and I did not call it Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Now, there are clearly a countable number of computable real numbers. These are the ones that could be computed by the most powerful computer around, namely a universal Turing machine. Once you have such a machine, certain programs will compute real numbers, and others will just get hung up and do nothing. And so, since the number of programs is countably infinite, because how many programs are there, if we think of programs as binary sequences, how many programs of length one are there? Just two, right? Zero and one. Then we can enumerate all programs of length two. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. And you keep going. Every program is in that list, and not everyone produces a computable real number. So there must be no more than a, count a countably infinite number, and clearly there are a countably infinite number of computable real numbers. So far, no problem, no mental breakdown on, on my part. But then Turing, in this paper, has a famous proof. He says, compute the comp first computable real number to one decimal place and complement it and print it out. Compute the second computable real number to two decimal places, complement that bit, and print it as the second decimal place of a number. It just it looks exactly like Cantor's argument that the reals are uncountably infinite, right? So, but wait a minute. We have to go back to the assumptions. It turns out the assumption here that's wrong is not that the computable real numbers are countable. They certainly are. It's that there is an effective program. There is a program that, given i, will compute the ith computable real number to as many decimal places as you want. That's what mathematicians decided was the, the wrong assumption. So the computable real numbers, while there is a first one, a second one, a third one, and so on, we'll never know it. God knows it, but we don't. Can you see where that would just 
that, that was the result that really shook my uh, foundations. Now, what I should have done is what I did about 15, 20 years later as I worked on my marriage. I should have given up on trying to base everything on logic. That was very illogical, especially since in my marriage and with my two daughters, I kept getting negative experimental results. You'd think uh, logic would have told me to try something different. And especially given Gödel's incompleteness theorem and this result of Alan Turing's that I just mentioned. In fact, I even used logic as a weapon to win arguments where logic did not apply. Now, this had become second nature to me as I moved through adolescence, but in 1964, when I was, oh God, 19 years old, I had to write an essay for admission to the Engineering Honor Society, Tabet Pi. And one of the questions was, what are, your uh, what, what are some of your strengths and weaknesses? And for one of my weaknesses, here's what I wrote. We actually found this going through old papers. And so this is a verb, word for word what I wrote. Another of my faults is trying to argue an emotional issue on rational grounds. I will present rational arguments to support my side of the argument when they will do no good since both parties' minds have been decided by non-rational means. However, I sometimes enjoy these discussions as the other person or persons usually strike back with emotional pleas and in this world, rationality is held to be more important." End of quote. Now, fortunately, my wife and I discovered this after we had made a lot of progress in our marriage or we really would have gotten divorced because she looked at it and she said, my God, not only did you torture me this way, which she'd known I'd been doing, but you knew you were doing it. You did it consciously. I had to tell her, honey, I know it appeared that way, but I have to tell you, it had become such an unconscious reflex, I didn't even know I was doing it. And fortunately, I don't do it anymore. So fortunately, I did later learn to stop using logic, misusing logic as a weapon when it did not apply, or using it as a weapon ever. Uh, but as the risk analysis arguments that I just applied to nuclear deterrence show, we as a society have not realized the illogical logic that we've applied to nuclear deterrence. And in fact, there's a veneer of logic using game theory that makes nuclear deterrence, it's a very seductive veneer of logic that makes it look like it works. But we need to look, under, we need to look at the assumptions that underlie it, just as in Alan Turing's result, it was important to look very carefully at what were the unstated assumptions. Like there was an uns the unstated assumption that if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the integers and some set that it can be computed. Well, it turned out that was not the case. Well, I'll conclude here by hoping that while at first there may appear to have been very little overlap between the book my wife and I just finished, A New Map for Relationships Creating True Love at Home and Peace on the Planet, and this is not the ACM conference on marriage counseling or, or peace. I do hope that what I've told you today has shown that there are strong connections. I also hope, free plug, that it'll get you to buy the book. It's on Amazon. Uh, again, the, um, you can just go to Amazon, put my name in, or you can go to anewmap.com. And if you do that, the ACM Turing Award will have helped get the ideas in the book out in more ways than just giving me half a million dollars to publicize it, and that will be the most important thing of all. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Okay, I can't see anything, so I'll let you handle the questions. I just see, I just see very bright lights. Right, if you want to ask a question, please come forward to the microphone. Oh, there is a microphone right up here. Oh, okay. Well, um, so thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm sure you're aware of this, but there are also a lot of specific instances particularly during the Cold War, where there was nearly nuclear catastrophe, it just, you know, because of some computer glitch or radar mm -hmm. glitch or something like that. So I was wondering if you 
would uh, have any thoughts on that. I, I thank you, I do. And in fact, uh, the book lists several of them and uh, various papers of mine have others. And if you go to my Stanford homepage and look at publications, the last three are on these areas. You'll find a number listed there, including uh, one was a report on the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis that lists a, a number of these. But one that is almost unknown even within the international relations community is uh, described in the book. It's a, uh, uh, what I call the Cuban bomber mini-crisis of 2008. Because I watch for these things. I look for these. Uh, risk analysis helps get a better idea of the risk of a catastrophe by looking at accident chains that could lead to the catastrophe and then seeing how often we've gone down those various accident chains and how far. And I created such an accident chain for the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, the short answer is that in July 2008, we repeated five and a half of the steps that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. We stopped half a step short of having a full-blown crisis. So yes, uh, we definitely need to be paying attention to those. That's also, by the way, a good way to reduce the risk. Because even if we disagree on what the risk is, if you start paying more attention to those early warning signs, then you, instead of seeing them as that every, all the backup systems worked, then we can actually reduce the risk. That's kind of what I was getting at with the question of an, another adva major advance in factoring. And by the way, there was a minor tremor within the last few years, an algorithm uh, for, that computes discrete logarithms very quickly uh, in fields of special characteristics, small characteristic. And if you'll remember, the number field CIV started out only working for numbers of a very special form, but then was generalized. Okay, other questions? Yeah, someone's coming up. Back there, I see it. Professor Elman, thank you so much for your fantastic speech. You mentioned cyber deterrence. Uh, I was not you know, completely clear what you feel about it, its utility, but what about cyber, non, cyber weapons non-proliferation? Okay, cyber deterrence. I think that deterrence is a mistake in itself. Uh, there's a section in our book called too, many, uh, too Few Carrots, Too Many Sticks. We think in terms of threats. Uh, deterrence is a threat. If you um, do something I don't like, I will destroy you. We have nuclear compellence. That's if you don't do something I want you to do, I will destroy you. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Khrushchev was trying to deter a second American invasion of Cuba after the Bay of Pigs invasion. And Kennedy was trying to compel uh, Khrushchev to remove his missiles uh, from Cuba with his threats. And the only word that we have that's generally accepted for the carrot side of diplomacy is appeasement. And we all know what that means. It, well, maybe not, but it's young people in the audience. It means Munich 1938 when the Sudetenland was given to Czechos, uh, uh, taken away from Czechoslovakia and given to um, Hitler. Um, and again, I don't have time to go into it, but there's a whole section in our book about why appeasement does not deserve the bad rap it deserves. I think what we need to be looking for to improve cybersecurity is holistic solutions. We need to start looking, what are the real gripes that the United States and Russia, which are two of the major uh, actors in this uh, uh, cyber pranks or cyber hacking, whatever you want to call it, what really do we have that separates us? I think it's mostly pride. Uh, and if we were to really look at it and see what the consequences of our continuing an adversary relation are likely to be in the long run versus um, coming to really understand one another's concerns, we'll be much better off. So again, we have seven, well, the, the book is primarily about the personal story of my wife and myself going from being madly in love when we met 50 years ago to being headed for divorce 13 years later to being madly in love again. We do have seven sections on seven international uh, situations, including one on Russia, and uh, I'd encourage you to read that. I think if we understood the Russian concerns better, we would be able to take actions that would help relieve the stress. It's not to say that Russia hasn't made mistakes, but one thing I emphasize continually in the book is that the only time my marriage got better was when I stopped worrying about my wife, what my wife needed to do to make the marriage better, and started focusing on what I could do to make it better. In the same way, while Russia has made many mistakes, we in the West need to focus on our own where we have the power to correct them. Another question. Okay, so there, there was this question uh, on, uh, um, what was it, cyber non-proliferation, cyber mm -hmm. weapons non-proliferation. So I was wondering about defenses. So it seems that kind of on the physical side and physical warfare with nuclear weapons, there's really 
no point in trying, or it's very hard to defend against it. You could do something about it, but I think it's quite hard, so there's this question, but in, in cyber um, security, maybe there's more chances to, to building uh, secure systems and have proper defenses. So what is your opinion on that? Uh, well, as the attack last Friday shows, it's going to be very hard. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that's very insecure that's going to be very hard to get rid of, almost impossible. So I think, the first of all, we need to be paying more attention as to what we, we allow people to sell and how we can shut things down that uh, end up having security weaknesses. But I think the real solution is to develop a more cooperative international um, uh, uh, mode, of, mode of operation so that the United States, uh, NATO, let's even call it, and Russia and China uh, start seeing what they have in common rather than what separates them and looking at the relative costs of cooperation versus adver continuing an adversarial relationship. Oh, one other thing, we need to work on re cyber resilience because even if we totally solve the cybersecurity problem, there are problems with sunstorm, uh, I'm sorry, solar storms uh, bringing down the electrical grid, for example, and we need a more resilient grid to do that, and that would also help with cyber. Okay, and what time is it? Do we need to end now, or how are we doing? Do we have time for one more? I think we have time for one more quick question. Okay, go. Okay, thanks. Uh, my question is about the, what, what, what you think about the fact that society is embracing more and more the internet for all kinds of activities. At the same time, what we're witnessing is that the technology is not really ready in the sense that, the, I mean, most systems get broken and the internet is used more and more for nefarious purposes, including cyber war and cyber crime and so on. So don't you think that at some point it would make sense to slow down the digitization of a society until we come up with sound and sustainable solutions on the front of security and privacy? And we just going too fast in embracing new technologies and just discovering that actually we haven't done a proper job? Yeah. If there was a practical way to do what you suggest, then it would probably be wise to slow down. But there's no practical way to do it. And it's not just cyber. You can see it with gene splicing and you know, genetic engineering. So the way I describe the problem, the real problem, in my opinion, is not nuclear weapons. It's not uh, uh, the growth of the internet. It's not nuclear power. It's not genetic engineering. The real problem, if you look underneath them, is the chasm between the godlike physical power that technology is giving us. So historically, 100 years ago in the Bible, only God was supposed to be able to create new life forms. Only God was supposed to be able to destroy whole cities like that. We can do that today. And yet, so here's our physical power through technology is godlike. And when I ask people how close to godlike our maturity level is as a species, they laugh. And it's that chasm. At best, we're irresponsible adolescents, and often we are in the terrible twos where we throw tantrums. And so we, well, I don't think we can slow down this technological advance, but what we need to do is use it as an adrenaline shot to make us grow up a lot faster. We are growing up, contrary to what the media tells you. The incidence of war is decreasing. The number of nuclear weapons has fallen by a factor of four. Uh, we are becoming a much more mature species very rapidly. The question is, is it happening fast enough? Yeah. And what I want to see happen is the kind, like this book we've written, the, the, the risks we pose, will be used to give an adrenaline shot to the better angels of our nature so they win the war on war, they win the war on cyber uh, crime, and um, we then build a world. It's not just the threat that pushes me, it's the vision of the kind of world we have to build, which is so much better than we have now, that pulls me much more than I'm pushed. Thanks. So before we leave, uh, Edgar wanted to make a few announcements, but before that, uh, let's all thank uh, Professor Hellman for the enlightening talk. <laughs> <laughs>